Good evening and welcome back to the shop. Man, it feels like it's been a long time, but it's only been one week. Can you believe it? I think it was from all those courses we were sliding in there that, I don't know, one week seems like it's too far apart. But anyway, I'm glad you decided to hang out with us tonight in the shop. And of course, if you like this content, go ahead and like, share, and subscribe and all that fun stuff. We do appreciate it. But tonight I want to get into the art of making a true mortise and tenon door, a raised panel door to be specific. And I want to show you the simple techniques that I use to make many uh, raised panel frame, door, or whatever. Now, last time my, I was doing a presentation on, on hanging our setting butt hinges and how soon we forget <laughs> <laughs> and that was the appropriate title for the night but don't worry everybody I'm good <laughs> as far as I know uh, but we're glad to have that behind us so anyway uh, <laughs> don't, don't think we missed that one so during the um, uh, that presentation that dynamic scintillating presentation on inlaying butt hinges. <laughs> I'm never going to be able to say that again without thinking of that great night. Um, I showed you this frame and I believe it was Lupe the Magnificent said we should have a night where we talk about making that frame and panel. However, this one's a little more complicated to get into a simple shop night live because we have that that bead and the miter joint coming into this mortise and tenon frame panel. This is a really nice classic old one, but I want to show you a frame and panel that's more like this one. So it's a little more straightforward, but it, it has a lot of integrity because it's a true mortise and tenon frame with a haunch. Okay, <laughs> why are you smiling? I, you seem excited to be able to say that word. I don't know why. I don't know. I, I just had a hunch somebody was going to say something oh, about goodness. that word. I did not practice that with you. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, this, this door is a really nice uh, fundamental piece that you can make and for shop fixtures and whatever. And as I said in my little announcement for today's, if you've read it, um, I went for several years, more than maybe several, what, what do you count, over five? Um, Too many. Having uh, a vanity in our shop bathroom that had the vanity top, and I had just built the box. I didn't have a face frame around the outside. And we temporarily hung some curtains across there. You know, maybe you've done that too. Just put a little curtain rod, and you get your curtains, and to get it, and it's fine but it was kind of too long to be there. And someone once made a comment about it. Oh, you still got these here? And that, that did it. So I finally said- Thank I you, whoever that was, thank you. <laughs> it was Dave Menser. He visited, <laughs> anyway, the guy who used to work with me. Um, but, a long time ago. <laughs> but um, so we, so I went ahead and um, made the doors and this is actually one of them. I just pulled it right off of the frame. So nice. And it was a nice, enjoyable process because it's made of white pine and I've just got shellac on it. It has a little amber color to it, but it does yellow up as time goes on. And it was really simple and fun to make. And I don't know why I spent so much time delaying. I think one of the main reasons was I first had to put a frame into a weird situation. Um, if you're ever visiting the shop, you'll see why. But once I had the, f the box, the frame in place, then it was just a matter of making some doors. And I used this traditional hinge, which is probably among the easiest hinges to mount, called an H hinge. And you just set it into the opening and with shims holding the door fixed in place with the set reveal that you want on the side here, you just mount these and screw them to both sides, take out your shims and you're good to go. And it's a classic kind of traditional look. And these, these are, um, 
I don't think these, I didn't get these at Horton Brasses, but these are not the best ones. The ones at Horton are, are really nice. So another plug for Horton. I don't know what it is. It's been Horton Brasses uh, Shop Night Lives, but <laughs> they're good and, and you'll enjoy that. If you want to put up some simple H hinges, that's the way to go. All right, so I'm going to set this aside. Yeah, they're great. And we're actually going to make a door similar to that. Now we're going to make one to approximately fit this opening. We're not going to mount the door or anything, and I have done some prep work so we can squeeze this in. You're probably wondering, how is he going to pull this one off? Well, I did do some prep, and you'll see, um, you know, the old let me take that one out of the oven thing. But um, I'm going to set aside this frame. We may refer back to it. But you might remember this cabinet. This is the ash bow front hanging cabinet. And I made a, a Cooper door to approximate that opening. And I am planning on building a simpler uh, kind of nice uh, white pine quarter sawn frame for this door. So, but in the meantime, I wanted to make a, rather than the Cooper door, which if you missed that episode, that was like two or three ago, you can go back in Shop Night Live and check that out, how we made this Cooper door. And it's not finished, but we go into that in that episode. Um, but I just want to make one approximately this size to fit this opening. And this has a bowed shape, but we're just going to set it so that it's flat in this space. That's where we hope to end up really fast, right? <laughs> so here are my parts for this adventure in mortise and tenon raised panel door with a true haunch. Okay, so what I'm starting out with are the, the um, styles, the, the vertical pieces on the sides. And the traditional way that it goes is the styles run the full length, top to bottom. And then the rails are cross-fitted and mortised into the styles here, okay, the, the upright pieces. So I've got my styles here, and I cut them already just so they'd fit into that opening, a little play. And I also have my rails here, and I've got a top rail and a bottom rail. And notice the bottom rail is wider because I want to do this in a traditional manner. And the traditional way is usually you will see the styles and top rail are the same dimension. They're the same width and thickness, of course, where the bottom rail is usually about a third wider as a general rule, than the top rail. You know, I've never explored why that is. I think it, it adds a little strength, obviously. It makes the door a little heavier toward the bottom. Um, you get a little wider tenon, um, so you get a little more truing, I guess, with that. But other than that, I'm not sure why that is. Maybe some of you have some ideas. Does and you it can make the door close? I'm not sure. Uh, why would it, you know? Because it's just, it's basically just yeah. a wider rail at the bottom. I have a sense that it's more for structural reasons. Um, and, but regardless, I like doing it because I need lots of doors and period doors replacing. Mm -hmm. I'm talking cabinet type doors, and I always try to do that. So for our dimensions for our example door, We've got a one and three quarter inch wide by three quarter inch thick. And so that's true of our style and our top rail. Our bottom rail, instead of one and three quarter, is two and a half inches wide. Other than that, it's the same length. We'll talk about the lengths of the rails in a few minutes, but I want to start out by just marking out the pieces. So you can see, I got this out of some stock where I actually resawed some eight quarter white pine stock. So I ended up with, you can see that grain on the end, quarter sawn and rift sawn uh, white pine style. So that actually is a nice idea if you can do it because you're going to end up with a, a more stable 
uh, style. It's not going to expand and contract as much. And the quarter sawn tends to stay much truer and straight and true, which is what you really want with a style. You don't want these ever to use a twisted piece here. You really have to use trued up material to make doors or when you clamp it up and glue it up, that twist will translate across the door. So you can't, all the parts you want to really make sure they're dead flat and true and that's why I prefer to dress my own material here to control that flatness of all the elements. Okay, a lot of, a lot of doors, um, you don't notice this a lot of times, but they actually have a, a built up core where they flip on edge and they laminate multiple pieces across so that you're getting almost like a quarter sawn pieced up core and then they veneer over the top face and back with like a thicker maybe 3 8 inch uh, finished material front and back. Oh nice, I'm talking about house doors and you can do this on cabinet doors as well. And what that does is it creates a more stable, um, long lasting, true frame. So you don't run into the problems with twisting doors. Believe me, it's a, it's a nightmare because if, especially if you're doing tall doors and you close it and the top is springing out a little and the client calls you and says, hey, why is my, why is my door not closing all the way? <laughs> I heard people talk about that. I've never actually experienced that myself. You've <laughs> not had that kind of call, no. <laughs> you learn the hard way on that one. So anyway, we've got our parts like that. And what I want to do is mark them out. So being that we, we sawed them out sequentially, we have kind of like a book matched opportunity here. With, you can see the grain is running a little angular on these pieces. And that's no problem. Let's go ahead and, and book match these. So we just kind of open them like the pages of a book. And then we have that mirrored grain across there. And I like to give it more of a triangulation like that so it's wider at the bottom visually with the grain and then tapering up rather than this method. If it was this way, it would be running out, which is just unsettling and disturbing, <laughs> right? We need it to be pyramid to give us that wider base, st stability, strong look. So let's take that. And once we have that decided, we're going to make a little maker's triangle here and that will describe the face it's pointing to the top and this is the right and the left that uh, point you're making is actually what several people have mentioned as to why the bottom rail is thicker for a grounded perspective R okay commonly done also in uh framing like picture frame perfect oh well, that's good to know yeah i've always i hope i described that well for all of you who mentioned that yeah, that's a great, that's, thank you. That makes sense. And it's very, it's very much the same idea here with the way you lay out grain, that you want to have that kind of base foundation on appearance. And, and that's probably why I just like it. Um, just visually, it feels stable and strong to have that weight at the bottom. So we're gonna decide now on our top and bottom rail. And these are pretty much the same. And I don't see any main blemishes here. Nothing really to be that concerned about. So I'm going to position them like this and make another triangle, maker's triangle here. And that's just going to describe how the bottom rail will conf be configured and the top. So the triangles are always on the face. We're going to be referencing off the face as we make the cuts for all these cuts in order to end up with flush surfaces when we join our frame together. Alrighty, you know what? We're not gonna worry about the panel right now. We're just gonna focus on the frame and getting the groove into the frame and then the mortises and then we're going to cut our tenons to fit our mortises. That's a lot to do, huh? Let's get over to the table saw and get to work. Uh, here we go. Ah, nice of you to join me over here. <laughs> I've got a, a little bit of prep done here, but um, what I always try to do when I'm making a set of doors is have some extra stock on hand. Have some extra pieces of the same thickness as your frame to use as test pieces or setup pieces 
on your saw as you go ahead and make your awesome precision cuts. Alrighty, so let me put my tape measure on my belt. I get feel more official. See, you gotta have a 25 foot tape measure as a furniture maker. <laughs> my neighbor who's a builder, he makes fun of me when I come over with my 16 foot tape measure on my hip. He's like, what, what's that? You know? <laughs> like, like, we don't build things out of furniture that are 25 feet long. So uh, give me a break. All right. So anyway, here we are. We've got our, um, we've got, I actually went ahead and put the dado cutter into the table saw. If you want to see, it's not just any dado cutter. It's super dado. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just looking at today, you know, like, it's super. It's not just normal, it's super. So, I don't know, I think Freud still makes these. I don't know if you can get the super anymore, but I bet you can. But you can get these. For them. I you, don't know you if did it was have the super. Link, right? I did, but I didn't check to see if it was super. No, I bet it is, because uh, if it's Freud, I don't think they changed that. Someone can check that for us. Okay, so I got my super dado in there, a quarter inch. <laughs> I didn't put any of the, the middle blades, I just have the two outside. So we've got, when you use just the two outside blades, you get a quarter inch wide kerf. And that's nice. And the nice thing about dado cutters is that they leave a flat surface at the bottom of the groove that they cut. So what we want to do is set up this dado to cut a groove to accommodate the door. So the door, let's just do this. Here's our, here's our maker's mark here. So we know the door is going to be on the inside of all these marks. So we want to run this groove down this whole middle and then down this whole middle. And then on our top and bottom rails, same thing, right where the maker's mark is there. There you go. So that's where we're going to be grooving. So let's get grooving. And when we cut the groove, we always want to keep the, the triangle or the face surface against the fence. Okay, so that's going to be our reference. In case our groove is not dead center. Now, a lot of times, you, you don't need a dado cutter, basically, to do this cut. It's good to have a flat-bottomed kerf cutting saw that, what do we call that, the number one grind on your table saw blade will leave a flat curved bottom. But, so you can do this with a straight cutter and you could just rotate around and get a centered groove that way by running twice, okay, with an eighth inch curve and have it slightly offset so that after both cuts you end up with an, a quarter inch in width, okay. That's perfectly legal, okay? But the, the way I'm gonna make this, the mortises after this, I prefer not to use that method and rather go with the quarter inch dado. You can use that method. It just takes a little more precise setup because you wanna end up with a nice quarter inch groove if possible, okay? That's, that's kind of key. So that when we mortise, we're gonna use a quarter inch hollow chis chisel mortiser which will dial in so it fits right in that quarter inch groove. So that, the groove actually helps you align the mortise for the frame. So that's what we're gonna do. But even though we're using the dado, which is gonna give us the nice, uh, true quarter inch wide groove, we wanna get it pretty much close to center. Anyway, so I'm gonna use that scrap piece that I mentioned and let's just make a face side on that so I know what to put against the fence. And I think I already have it set up, but let me go ahead and check. I'm gonna grab my rule and... You know we never sh shut off the fans, are you okay? You want them off? I think it'd be smart, because okay. we're gonna see dust flying. What about the AC? Okay, excuse me. I forgot to do a little housekeeping here. <laughs> it's a real... Oh, so much better. It's 
quieter. I don't have to yell anymore. Was I yelling? Okay. No, All right, so I raised the blade approximately a quarter inch as well. I want to end up with a quarter inch depth on this as well. It, you could go a little different, but that works nicely. So let's put our gear on and check this groove. Here we go. it a little. Looks good. So let's run it the whole way. Okay. So I got my groove established. It's pretty close to center. I think it's right spot on. But if it's not, it's no worries because when we cut our tenon, we're gonna cut it to fit this groove so that our face is a flush. Now, I'm ready to run the groove into my other pieces. Before I do that, I like to get organized. Make sure the faces are oriented toward the fence and I have the groove side down. Okay, whoop, there's the face, stay to the right. There we go, so we can keep everything. Just pick it up and run it. I won't have to fumble around with it. And less likely to make an error there, which can mess you up a little. Here we go. Turn on our dust collector. All right, stay right there. <coughs> Tom, what's the hook rule that you're using? What's that? Can you tell us what hook rule you're using? Who makes that? Oh yeah, I'm using the, um, the Woodpecker's six inch hook rule. These things are great. I, I didn't know how I would like them. They sent me one, they sent me this one and the foot long and you know, I always, I only talk about stuff I, I like, and uh, these are cool. I mean, you saw how fast it is. I've spent so many years just holding it, like aligning it just right, hoping I had it aligned right. But here, it references perfectly on the edge, and you can measure exactly the thickness. I mean, it's not a dial indicator, but it's plenty good for what we're doing here, you know? All right, so... What I want to do now is lay out the mortises, and the mortises, as I mentioned earlier, go only into the styles. So the rails are going to mortise into the styles. So we don't need our top and bottom rail right at the moment. Set those aside. And here we go. So actually, I do need them for a second. I'm going to use them to mark this. Let's just Think here now, this, this top rail will have a tenon fashioned onto it. We're going to make tenons that are 7 eighths of an inch long. You could go a little longer or shorter if you prefer, but we're going to go 7 eighths. That was traditionally what I did a lot with Pug. Um, so a quarter inch of that is going to be in the groove, and then 5 eighths will be actually in the true mortise that we're going to set in there. So that bottom of that groove is actually going to be the bottom of our mortise up here because we're going to try to go flush with the top of our rail just like that. Okay. So I want to mark on this piece where the bottom of that mortise is going to be. I can easily set that up. 
by just taking my pencil, which there it is. And let's just hold this. Could put it in the vise, but we're not going back to the bench right now. It's too far. All right, we're going to just set this right to the bottom there. Okay, you see I'm, I'm referencing off the outside, and I'm just going right to the bottom of the groove. Now I can come over here. This is the top rail, and I can just make a little pencil mark across there. Okay, so when I watch the mortiser come down, I'm going to be on this side of that pencil mark. So let's go ahead and mark the other side on the top. We'll get that pencil mark. Now the bottom is the same thing, except we've got a wider rail down there. So we have to reset our square. Make sure those are the same. Reset our square here. Right to the bottom of that. Sorry, I got my finger in the way. Right there. Okay. Now we've got that. We can bring our styles over. And we're going to just mark up from the bottom of that. Now what's great is usually you're making several doors. So you get the efficiency of marking across several at a time. But every step we do here, we're just doing on one. So it might seem less efficient than it actually is if you can knock out several doors of the same size. Now, we're going to go the full mortise depth, but we're not going to do that out to the end. We're going to step in, go full depth, and then we'll have the tenon will go just that quarter inch depth that we have there, or that's actually the haunch. And that's just like a, a shallow tenon before the full depth of the tenon in here. Um, it's, they say it gives you a little more uh, strength from twisting of the piece, like aligning, but honestly, I don't think it matters that much. What, what it is is, I think it was more of a practical approach on running doors because they would use a plow plane to run this groove first and then they would mortise into using the groove as the guide to deepen the mortise but not go all the way out to the end because you don't want to weaken the rail. If we went full depth there we'd have a flap of wood. So what we're going to do is we're going to step in a reasonable amount. I think I couldn't decide between three eighths and a half. A half seemed too much. Three eighths seemed not enough. So 7 sixteenths seem just right. So that's what I'm going to do. Phew. Okay. You were sweating that out, I right? I was wondering what you were going to choose. Tom, Mike's asking, what, if you had to make mortises without a hollow chisel mortar, sir, would you make them before making the groove? No. I, oh, great ask. Uh, no, I make them just how I described because... Um, if you can run the groove, see if you're going to do hand tools all the way or, or run a regular drill bit, use the groove as your centering alignment. So you can use that. I would, I would mark it out just like I'm doing here. And then, like let's say we would mark our, the bottom here. And you could get a line. You could actually get a line down in there if you want to see a little better and you can use you would use a standard quarter inch mortising chisel so if this was done by hand you'd be plowing this out with a um, a quarter inch uh, grooving plane so whether you know like if you were making tongue and groove edging there are these planes that you'll have a quarter inch cutter that that drops down and you have a fence keeping it referenced off the fence and then you have usually you have the corresponding plane that cuts the two sides and leaves the tongue to correspond and give you a flush groove. But here, we're modern, we're modern men and women. So we use modern tools where we get the chance. I mean, I love hand tools, you know that, but we've got to get the job done sometimes and why not have the modern conveniences of tools? 
plus tools are fun and especially powerful ones. Not everybody has them. That's no, I, think I know his question. Yeah. No, of course, but I mean <laughs> uh, a table saw with. <laughs> is a sort of a fundamental thing. You gotta cut wood a lot. So you can obviously do your groove on the table saw. And the mortisers, I would encourage you, if you're gonna do some mortise and tenoning, they're really not that expensive and they're pound for pound, they're well worth what you get. You can get a, a good bench top mortiser for three to four hundred dollars. Maybe not the greatest. Look on Marketplace and Craigslist and people are selling them. Unbelievable how good deals you can get. Anyway, um, I'm going to go ahead and mark all of these step ins here on now this step in is the same on both ends because we're coming in from the end it doesn't matter how wide the rail is we're just going to step it in that amount okay so it's between those marks I don't really have to scribble in here I I know it's in between these marks we're going to be grooving right i mean actually mortising so just right there so this would be a perfect opportunity to use a, a quarter inch mortising chisel like hand mortise if you'd like to do it by hand if you can clean it out first with a quarter inch uh drill bit awesome you know and then you can chop it right out white pine like this is kind of fun and easy to do by hand if you'd like to try that all right so now we got that, let's head over to the mortiser and I'll show you the setup there. <coughs> Here we are. What, what are you doing? <laughs> I was going over there. Are you going around to the drill press? You thought you'd go the long way? I sometimes get my tools mixed up. Oh, okay. Just, the key is just follow me. Yeah. I right. know I'll be at the appropriate tool. Yeah. <laughs> if you go over there oh, and I'm over here, it doesn't, it doesn't key. work. That is a key. All right. So anyway, here we go. We've got our setup. We've got our hollow chisel reference off the fence. Now, I already adjusted this. Hopefully it's working for us. Now, if our groove is slightly off center, what we're going to do is we're always going to put the face against the fence so that that will be sure that we get the same alignment um, later on when we cut our tenons everything is going to be referencing off the fence so we end up with a flush surface if it's not dead center all right so now we're going to roll our table now this one yes this is more expensive than a table mounted but um it's fine all right so i adjust i'm looking to where the cutter is coming down. I want to see it slightly scraping both sides. This is a good time to use your, actually to use your test piece. I thought I had that set up, but I'm not totally thrilled with that right there. Uh, let me get my test piece here. Here we are. I'll just set that in the middle. Let's get this set up. And so I'm going to move my table a little bit front to back until Oh wow, that one looks, that one looks perfect. So we're just gonna go with that one. Okay, we're going with that setup. I'm getting a little scrape on both sides. It's perfect. This is just a demo anyway. I don't know why I'm fussing with it too much. Um, it's, it's what you do. It's the door to nowhere. <laughs> Another door to nowhere. You do it always well. Okay, so we're gonna go ahead and mortise. I'm gonna eyeball this right down to the pencil line there. Here we go. Oh, I forgot to mention, I did set the depth and the way you set the depth on these, I like the drill press where you come down, you come down to where it hits and oh by the way a hollow chisel mortiser as well is a drill bit standard kind of drill bit spinning inside a square chisel that's hollow thus <laughs> and it's got these deep grooves in it so that as you drill the chips come up and are spilled out on 
on the top so they're not getting jammed up in there. Sometimes they do, but no big deal. Um, anyway, I've got this bottomed out at the bottom of the groove, and here's my depth stop here. So what I did was I knew I wanted like to go 11 sixteenths more. So I'm going about a sixteenth deeper than my tenon will be long. And you can measure this, or you could have a little feeler stick like this that is 11 sixteenths, and it fits right under there. So now I know I'm going to plunge that depth. Here we go. Just slide that down. I have that little riser block under there so that I'm pinning it in the center here. All right, now I got a jammed one, but that's okay. Have fun. All right, so that's good. I'm not going to do them both because I have one to switch out, but I would do them both just like that. And so we have our full depth mortise and we're stepping down and we just need to do a little clean out work with a chisel back at the bench before we fit that. But we'll do that uh, after we cut our tenon. Okay, let's go ahead and that's enough where we can I might have to grab the chisel just to clean it a little bit so we can fit our test piece. Speaking of that, where is that test piece? Put it back over here. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead now. We've got our, our groove for our panel. We've got our mortises going full depth. So we have a true mortise. We've got the haunch set up for our tenon. Now we just have to cut the tenons on our rails. Now, I was measuring for the width of this door, and that opening is like 13 and 5 eighths. So usually, the way I always would figure this out, the way Pug always did it, is you take the two styles, put them together, so this establishes how much they take up in the width of the door. Right? Then take your tape measure, I'll do it this way so you can see, and I said, all right, I want my door to be 13 and 5 eighths wide. So I'm going to set my tape measure to 13 and 5 eighths right here. Then I look over here and I see I've got a little over 10 and a 16th. Okay, so 10 and a 16th, say, and strong or 10 and an eighth weak. <laughs> when I say that, I mean a 32nd, whatever. That is how long I need my rails to be shoulder to shoulder. So that's my shoulder measurement. Now to that I just add the length of my tenons. And my tenons are each going to be seven eighths long. Together that adds one and three quarter inches. So I'm going to go out from ten and a strong sixteenth over to eleven and three quarters plus a strong 16. So I'm going to be out at 11 and 13 16 strong. And that is what I already cut these to length. Okay, so I'm 11 and 13 16 strong. All right, so that's a simple way to figure it out uh, using the tape measure. All right. Sure. Oh, um, this is a this is a little double end square. I didn't have my sound on. Let me see. Oh, Linda's forty asking. lashes. Sorry, 
No sound. Question is, what about if you use a domino? Make the mortise first and then the groove. Also, what is the little blue combination square you have? Um, this is, let me just get to the square. It's a double-ended square. We can put the link to this. Um, I don't know the exact name of this. There's no name. I know people have suggested how I could describe it. But it has kind of a an interesting corally like blue color to it or steel blue. Um, but we have a couple options for you to look at that you can pick up. The more money you spend on them, the nicer they feel in your hand. Uh, this one came from Woodcraft years ago. I don't know if they still have the same one, but the Sterrett brand is more expensive, but they're, they're pricey for what they are, but they're really useful, um, obviously. You could see how I was using it. So uh, the question about the about using the domino. Um, well, using the domino, you're trying to bypass the hassle of making a real tenon, okay? You're cheating, actually. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> a, a domino is a great tool. It's, it's kind of one of the, I think it's one of the best modern uh, tools to come out because it cuts, if you're not familiar with it, rather than just a dowel like a round hole, it's like a true tenon. But instead of just a drill coming out like a dowel would, and the dowels are inherently kind of weak because of the uh, lots of end grain are actually on the edges of the top and bottom of a dowel. So you don't have a great glue strength surface of a dowel joint. However, the the domino goes in and it's a rotating, high speed rotating drill bit, basically, or almost like a router bit. And it's, wa it's waving back and forth. So it cuts an elongated slot, almost like a mortise. Um, but you end up having rounded ends. And so it's not a, it's not a true mortise, but what it is is you then you insert a tenon into each side. So you have what's called a floating or loose tenon. So it gets glued into both sides. The tenon is not integral to the rail like a classic mortise and tenon. Uh, so the classic mortise and tenon is, has more integrity, like and more strength than a, a domino, but the domino is the next best thing. And the beauty of the domino is it it reduces your your need to do what I just did. So you know how we did that that measurement and we did the the ten and the sixteenth, and we said, okay, now you got to add this much for your tenons on both ends. No, you don't have to do that. With the domino, you just cut it to the ten and the sixteenth, and then you drill to each end, so you have this flat end, and you can drill. However, that's a good question because if you want the groove, this technique. The advantage of this technique is that you can run the groove right out the end. But if you have the groove, then you're going to be using the domino and kind of like, oh, now I got a gap there. The domino shines when it's my butt end 90 degrees to another surface, you know, or an angle, whatever. So you just cut all your pieces dead length with the true angle on the end. And then you just have to plow your domino and then fit the tenon. And it's a speedy way of going. So if I was using a domino, I probably would not run this groove. I would just set up the domino, basically make your frame everything to the, to the length, so you'd be 10 with this. And then I would set up on the router table a wing cutter or a, um, what am I talking too loud? <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting carried away. I'm excited. She's right there. Yeah, I am. Okay, let me come down. I would set up a wing cutter. <laughs> I can't calm down. And um, a quarter or a quarter inch um, router bit and drop it down and run the groove. Uh, so, and then stop before you get to the end. So you'd have to, you have a little more time involved in making your groove, but it probably makes up for that, you know? So hope that answers your question, but you're gonna have to run your groove secondary because you don't want a haunch at the end. Dominoes don't have haunches. Okay, we're doing this. All right, that's a good question. Mom. That was a long question, but if I talk too loud, just turn your volume down. That's what we do all the time, right on the TV. 
All right, so what else? Um, any others? Yeah, um, I did have a quick question from... I'm going to be changing the blade out while... Rory what? asked, why so shallow? What are you, what are you saying? Who is that? <laughs> what, are you, what are you saying here? Who is that? Rory. Rory, Rory, what, is, what does that mean? I'm, I'm trying to be deep about this. I, I don't know what... Where, I try to skip no, nothing. And this is, this is important to me. I don't know. I actually, I, uh, are you talking about the groove? I think he's referring to the groove. Okay. Um, you can go deeper if you want. You can go through up to three eighths or whatever. I don't, we're going to put a raised panel in there. And I'm going to do it the fundamental way where I'm going to do just a true old method where the, where the bevel is angled. A quarter inch is plenty for the panel to fit into. So the, it's a little stronger groove, you know, when you think of it, if it's not super deep. But the groove is adequate, deep, for the, deep enough for the panel. You'll see in a few minutes. But the tenon and the mortise goes in, and you've got a, a nice strong joint because you don't want the groove too deep or you're going to have the tenon traveling a ways before it actually reaches the mortise. It's kind of like a balance thing. Choose a quarter inch, you go three eighths. Have fun with it. I'm not, I'm not giving you the exact way to do it. You can do whatever you want. But I, I arrived at a quarter inch being deep enough. There have been times I've gone deeper um, with it. In fact, that door has a three eighths, but um, so be it. Here we go. Now we're going to um, put a regular blade back in. And we'll go ahead and get that in because the rest of our cuts are for the tenon. We need a regular He said blade. the mortise. Why so shallow on the mortise? Oh, I don't think that's that shallow. I mean, we're going to end up with a 7 eighths long tenon. And for this door, that's plenty deep. I'm actually even going to peg the tenon, peg the mortise and tenon joint. So it's plenty deep. I mean, you can go up to an inch, um, but that's a lot of glue surface and it's a strong joint for this. You will, but I, I usually on a door like this, you'd never go more than an inch deep. You could, but you could go more if you'd like. The frame is only an inch and three quarters wide. So we're basically going half the depth, the width of the frame with our mortise and tenon. So, uh, but if you want to do a one inch, by all means. Okay, so now we've got um, the plate in there and what we're going to do is cut our tenons. So actually I'm going to put in the, the plate that has a little closer tolerance and we're going to throw in our tenoning jig. We haven't seen this for a little while, right? And if you want to see how I made this jig, we do have another uh, Shop Night Live that you can link to. We've already linked to it. It's, it's going to be in the description for this video. Now, I want to raise the blade a little shy of the length of my tenon because we're going to just cut the cheeks first and then the shoulders after. The shoulders will be to the full depth and clean it up nicely to the full depth of the 7 eighths. So let's go a little shy of 7 eighths here with the cheek cut. And now I want to set up using my test piece. Where's that guy? Here it is. And cut the tenon so that it fits right in the middle of this groove. So I'll use my test piece and I'm, now I'm cutting the opposite of the groove. So I'm going to cut on this side of the groove. And I just want to leave that. And then I want to leave a quarter inch tenon. Now I'm going to reference again the face against the fence. And so I'm going to move the fence over. Now I'm going to use this little method. If you hadn't seen this before, this is just a little quick method for a spacer jig for your ten your tenon width. So this is uh, this I'm going to use to make two cuts. I'll show you in a second. Let's go ahead and set it up with that little spacer in there. So I'm going to bring it up and I'm looking right down and I want to see that cut that blade right to the edge of my groove. 
on the outside of the groove here because we're going to be cutting the tenon. Okay, that looks pretty good right there. I can see it's aligned nicely. So I'm going to make my first cut with the spacer in there. So I'll cut right there. Then I'm going to remove the spacer. Now the spacer is a quarter inch thick plus the thickness of the curve, which is about an eighth of an inch. So it's going to, the whole thing's going to push over three eighths of an inch about. And then I'll come in and I'll make my second cut. And what do you know? I'm right on the other side of the groove. So what that does is it saves me resetting. Now, if you use the other method where you want to just spin it around, you can do that as well. Okay, but I'm just using this because I'm, I ran my mortise right into my groove. Either method works. Um, enjoy whichever you choose. So now this is a test piece. I'm going to go ahead and make this and see if I'm centered. I may have to nudge it a, one way or the other. I do want to say when you're setting up these spacer jigs, they don't always, they're not always exact. So your tenon might be a little loose and you know, the groove is, you're actually, your tenon is too thin. In, what you have to do then is thicken your spacer. So that's what these pieces of tape are. They're just put on there to get it registered to the right curve of that particular saw blade. And there you go. You can go ahead and run them all there. So here we go. I'm going to give it a test. Check it out. I'm going to cut it and then trim it off, roughly trim it off the, the shoulders just to test how accurate we are and we'll bump it one way or the other. Okay. Okay, there. So now we've got the cheeks cut of the tenon, the two sides of the cheek, and now we're gonna make those square shoulder cuts. If you're not familiar with this, think of the tenon as a man's head, and that's his head, those are the cheeks on the side, and then the shoulder cuts are gonna go out, and the shoulder is really the crisp part that you see. So. We're going to go with our 7 8 tenon, so we're going to set the fence over so that I'm 7 8 to the outside of the blade, which should be about 3 quarters on my scale, which it is. And um, that's good. I'll lock it in there. Now I want to set the height, and you can do this with your, your test piece. I'll just put it there and I'll lower the blade until it's just skimming on that blade. It's a little slightly off-centered, 
which is fine. I just want to lightly score into the side. I think that's it. Now I'm going to use this little miter gauge as a, a backer. So I'll get a nice backing cut with this fence. I won't get a lot of tear out in this cut. I'm going to set this in. This is just to check my miter fence. I want to make sure it's nice and square. That's square. That's nice. And when I run these through, I'm going to just keep my rails dead flat against the fence as we run through. So I'll make one pass in this direction. I'll flip, make the other pass this direction. So as long as I keep that end flat on the fence and everything's square and true, those shoulders are going to be registered beautifully aligned right across the piece. So when it goes into the frame, you'll have a nice tight joint on both sides. Okay, now that little wedge of wood, as it comes off, it could get trapped in there and make a little noise. <laughs> so I'm going to just pre-cut these tenons off, I, or I could do double passes, but I'd rather... <coughs> oh, excuse me. Sorry. Sorry, we're going to hear that. that. Yeah. All right, a little dust. Give me what the dust collector. Okay, so let's go ahead, make our cross cut, and see what we got. All right. Okay, so now we're almost done with the joint, but the one thing we have to do is our is modify the bottom of our tenon. So here, in order to fit into, whoops, let's get the one I did here. In order to fit into the mortise, so we've got to notch that out, and when we notch it. We want to do it in such a way that we don't, um, let's see, that we leave the haunch or the tenon to seat. I usually, I try to get the haunch to be just the right length so it's tight against there. If you miss it a little shy, it's not the end of the world. If you're going to miss, you'd rather be slightly shy so that when you clamp it up, your shoulder is nice and tight. That's what you're going to see. So here's what we got to do. We know that we'll set our little square here. I'm going to set it from the end. I'm going to just set it to the bottom of that mortise where I actually cut it there. And they're all the same. That aligns with the line there. And so now on the actual tenon, that's how high I need to come up for that. Let's get this here. Okay, that's, I have to take this off. This is the full mortise width right here. Now I'm going to leave that haunch right there. I'm going to mark this on the other side too, just so we can see if we have to flip it over while we make the cut. Okay, so this is coming off. Now we're going to leave 
a haunch, about a quarter inch, are actually the true depth here. So if we, let me get a knife, stay right here. I was going to do this back at the bench, but it's easier to just stay there. Um, so here's my piece. If I had this in the vise, I would put it like this. And that's why I was going to do it back at the bench. <laughs> Let's go back to the bench just for a second. Yeah, it's a little awkward. Got another little square in the drawer. <laughs> you gotta have two sometimes. Okay, so here's where we're gonna have the haunch, and this is the this is the bottom of the rail. It actually goes like this here, right? So we're gonna set it right here on the edge. Get that stuff out of the way, and if I just rest it on the shoulder. Now I can take my knife and mark with the knife, make a nice little cut to mark the length of the haunch there. Okay. So having that, let's do it on, yeah, I'll, I'll just leave it there. And then I can take my square and set my knife right into that cut line, bring my square over, make that cut across. Let's just hold that up and see if it looks right. You're, I can't see. <laughs> Carol Lady's amazing. It's that old bike on the roof of the car thing again. She's coming in for the shot, and the, the light is like blocking me. Anyway, yeah. um, it feels like I'm, it's just a touch, a tad long as I sight it, so I'm going to just move my knife over slightly. Bring it up. Let's make a little cut here. All righty. And now we can see the cut is right here. I'm going to bring the square this way. I know I'm blocking you a little. Uh, again, I'm just going to put the knife right into the cut line. You're using a scalpel. I know. I'm surgical here. And I'm going to bring that cut down. Okay. Now, you could mark all your pieces with a pencil. I feel like that looks better. That's, that looks nice. Okay, so you could do all this by hand, but you'd have to mark every single one. For a cut like this, I like to set up the bandsaw for a little cut. So let's go back over to the bandsaw and make this cut. So I'll set, first I'll make this one where, and I would mark, I do this to all of them, right? I'm just going to show you this one, we'll fit one tenon. And I think that'll be good. Just going to set up here. But once you're... That looks good. I went about a quarter inch away. Now I'd go ahead and flip all my pieces. I would flip and make that cut on all of them. Just stopping a quarter inch away. Now I'll be able to flip it to this dimension and I'm going to set the fence so I just touch that knife line. Okay, I'm, I've got the blade on the waist side. That looks good. I might be a little shy, but let's see. All right, let's head back to the bench. Now this is where you would clean out all your mortises and I would use the quarter inch chisel here. Let's go to the bottom. Because the, the mortising chisel doesn't quite clean it all the way out but to the bottom but 
usually that's why I set it a little over depth. All right, so let's check this out. So this is the face here. So let's bring this piece up. This is my face, so that's the corresponding tenon. Let's get this set in. See how that spacer jig fit it just right? And then I'll set it in. And nice. All right, so we're slightly shy, but that's okay. My others are better, I'll show you in a second. Um, I would have spent a little more time. And you can also use your sample piece that you made your tenon on to set up your haunch. But you would go ahead and cut them all just like that. So look how quickly that is and nice and flush. And we've got a beautiful groove right all around and a true haunched mortise and tenon right there. All right. So the same goes for the top and the sides. And you'd end up with a frame like this. So let's bring this in. Here's my pieces. Here's my bottom rail with my little mark. You can see the haunch is always on the bottom and that will go right in here. And then my top piece, my mark, now I have the haunch on the top. I set it up just to be flush with the top there. And then I want to get the face, everything aligned. Now we can work right down to the other side of this frame. This nice traditional setup, easily made with the, the table saw and that tenoning jig and a mortiser. There you go. Boom. So look at those haunches on the end there. Nice, right? Right up tight. And then the face is snug too. If you can press it by hand and get a tight fit, it's going to be really nice when you put a little clamp pressure on there. So there's the frame and the panel is ready to go. So we've got that nice quarter inch groove all around there. I didn't want to go into a lot with this making the panel. I, I do want to show you just how I make the bevel cut on the panel. It's pretty simple. You just dress some material. Uh, you can go pretty thin with these panels if you like. Um, I usually don't go more than a half inch thick with a panel on a door like this because uh, it'd be sticking out quite a bit and it's plenty stable and light. It'll keep your door lighter that way. Um, I have used three quarter inch thick panels, but it's too, it's actually really more than you need because you're going to add a lot of weight to your door and it's plenty good. So this was, uh, this is a little less than a half an inch and I've already glued it up. It was two boards. Obviously I decided to glue it up along the sap edge. So this one ended up with a nice sap line down the middle. You have the heart of the white pine out here. That's just a little bit redder in color. And it's a little wider on this side. So I'm going to say this would be the face. Let's get a pencil. I have all pens now. Anyway, let's just take the chalk. It doesn't show great, but there's the face of my panel. So I'm going to have the raised panel on the outside. Sometimes you'd put the flat on the outside and the raised on the inside. That's the way a lot of old ones were. But I'm going to raise the outside. And so this is what will be taken down so that it fits into that groove. Okay. So let's head back to the table saw. We'll just rip this groove. I'll show you a quick cleanup. Oh, I should mention that I already sized this so that it's this dimension, which I don't have my rule, but we know that was like 10 and a 16th, remember? So then we're going to add our quarter inch on each side. So we get a 10 and 9 sixteenths and then take a little off because we have to allow for a little expansion. But because it's summer, it's kind of humid right now, it's not going to expand a lot more. So if we leave, you know, um, close to a sixteenth of an inch, that's enough for the expansion right now. In the winter, it's going to shrink up, and but not a lot because this is rift. It's it's pretty nice material. It's almost cortison in the middle here, and white pine is extremely stable. So you'll have a nice um, 
fit here. I, I'm going to fit it fairly close. And then top to bottom, it's the same thing, except you can go about a 30 second shy there if you'd like, because there's no expansion and contraction really over the length. So let's head over to the table saw. We'll run this bevel and then we'll actually, I'm going to glue up that door really fast. All right, so let's take this apart. We're going to set in the other throw plate so that we can tilt our blade a little bit. So I'm going to bring it up. Um, um, just real quick here. Would you use the same process for the back uh, panel back for a chest? Um, yeah, it's somewhat similar if you want to do a full blown raised panel back, except you have vertical dividers as well that are grooved on both sides and then they're tenoned into the end. So you have your styles down the side, you have a long top rail and bottom rail. And I usually run my panels vertically on a chest of drawers. So then you'll have center dividers and you'll groove those on both sides. So your panels end up being narrower. So you're not dealing with a lot of expansion contraction. But, um, and then you have the tenons in the midway up into your top and bottom rail. They're kind of fun to make and they go along fast and you end up with a beautiful looking back of a chest, almost too nice, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm gonna tilt the blade. Usually for these types of panels, I tilt the blade at about eight degrees, okay? It's kind of an eyeball thing. Depends how much of a bevel or a raised panel look you want. Um, mine usually end up being about a, an inch and a quarter to an inch and a half wide. Um, here we go. I'm going to just set it right there. That'll be good enough. And then, again, you're going to have a test piece that you're going to use to do a test fit into your groove to make sure it's fitting in there nicely. And I made a previous mark here to, so I wouldn't have to fuss around with this too much. And let's see if this does it. Okay, and then I'm gonna use the same tenoning jig, but I'll just take off the backer block so the tenoning jig comes in handy as an elevated kind of higher fence to assist in these type of cuts. So you can put the piece in here like this. Usually I will just clamp it on there. Let's see. Let's just say we've fussed with it so it fits in there well. Um, excuse me, I gotta blow my nose. Okay, so now we're, we're set up. We've done our test piece to fit into the groove. So it's just kind of snug in the groove and we're gonna make our bevel cut. Here we go.
Tom, getting, getting questions about the sequence. Shouldn't you, Boris is curious, shouldn't you short, do the short grain first? And Mike's saying, is it okay to bevel each end grain side first, then the long grain sides? Uh, yeah, you can do that. I always finish though with a long grain because when you go across grain, you might get some tear out here, but then when you go with long grain, whatever tear out there might be gets taken away. So that's why I started with the short grain, cross grain, and you always finish with a long cut. So you end up with no tear out on any of your corners. But once you've done that, you got to clean up those table saw marks. So let's head back to the bench. I'll show you that. And we will be ready to do a very quick glue up. All right, so what I love about this type of, of frame where you're using white pine, it's so friendly and fun to hand plane that when I get to this point, after everything is fitted, all of this material was just run right through the planer, like the thickness planer. So it's very consistent in thickness, but you still have all the planer marks on there. So I was doing all my joinery with material that still needed to be cleaned up. And you don't want to take an orbital sander around here. You round it all off and everything. But because it's so friendly and beautiful and fun to hand plane, it's really a lot of fun. And I like to actually leave it almost right off the surface of the plane. So once you're all fitted up, I take my parts individually, like let's say uh, this these rails and you can remember first to mark the face because you're going to take away your little uh, reference line there so you can make an arrow to the front or make your face that'll show me the front is here and here on the tenons I usually just put a face here that's going to be there and you can scribble to see what you're doing how you're cleaning it up, but this is where it's really great. And I also will hand plane this. Now I already hand planed both front and back of that panel before we beveled it. Um, pretty much in the same manner I'm gonna show you right now. And then we're gonna just skim the bevel to get that clean. Let's do that. And we will be almost done. So to do this, how about answering some questions while you do that? Would that be okay? Sure. <laughs> Go ahead. What I... Michael's curious that you don't use a stiffener plate on the table saw. Yeah, I don't really find that I've needed one. I've, I've bought them over the years. I, I haven't had a good, found a good one. I had one that had like a rubber feature on it, but I probably should try the, them again. But... Um, I don't, yeah, I don't typically use it. I had a, I had a bad experience <laughs> with when I bought it. It wasn't great, but I know there are probably better ones on the market. I'm talking 20 years ago, so I just don't, don't use them. But um, you certainly, they do help stabilize a little bit, I guess. I, <laughs> I'm not one to talk, right? Uh, here we go. Let me just do this and I'll enter another one. Here, I'm just going to... Go right on across. See how nice that is? And that's it. So there's no like lots of sanding. It's just simple. And you're going to hit both sides like this. And a lot of times when I'm doing uh, the backs of chess, I leave it like this. I just, I just bar barely touch it with sandpaper so that it's, it's what, you, what we call off, right off the tool so that you end up with just these beautiful polished hand plane surfaces. Now that's not to say you can do that everywhere, but that's really a nice clean surface. And then I would do it with the longer piece as well. Just readjust here. Tom Acer's asking, what, what do you think of cutting tenons with a dado stack and a miter gauge? Oh, that works too. I mean, you can, you can do the dado stack um, 
and cut both sides of your tenon, but the thing about that is it's just more labor intensive. It usually doesn't leave a, a true flat bottom because you're moving across the dado stack usually, and you get some little serrated bites in your tenon. And then also you have to adjust the height twice usually to flip it over. Unless you're dead centering it and you get, and all your stock is true, you're going to flip it over. With the method I showed you there, I was using a spacer stick. It doesn't matter where the tenon is located on the rail. It could be off center. You're still going to get the, the dead accurate fit to the mortise if your spacer stick has been dialed in to that thickness. So for those reasons, I, I just find it more cumbersome. Um, obviously, they have to switch out to the dado cutter to do that. And usually, uh, if I'm not running the groove, I don't even have to change the cutter. The whole mortise and tenon process is done with just the regular straight blade. So it's totally, it's totally doable. I mean, I've, I've seen a lot of people who've done it that way, but um, I just prefer that other method. So this is all you got to do. It's really nice to get this finished up. Now, you might have joiner or, or table saw marks on this edge, and I like to actually clean those, so I set, a, I set a plane very fine, and I usually, yes, do this before I cut the haunch length, but I'm gonna take such a light pass. Oh yeah, I'm gonna use this uh, number 62, Lee Nielsen, and it's set pretty nice. I'm gonna just set it nice and flat, and I take the whispery thin. That's it. So we got a nice clean edge there. And I would do that to all the pieces. Now, this is also a great plane um, you can use to true up the bevel. So let's go ahead and put that guy back. Let's set this in here. We'll go across the grain here. Just gonna lightly snug that and get my, just something to hold it over on this end here. Okay, so we're gonna just slope it down. I'm getting these really Nice, this is kind of end grain here. So I'm, slope, I'm sloping it downward to make kind of a downward cut. I can see the grain just getting polished. Beautiful. I'm doing this till I see no more of the table saw marks on there. Nice. Let's go ahead and do the other edge. Just do one other edge. Of course I do that on both ends and then Set this guy like that. Um, um, a question, not having a movable table saw on my mortar saw, would you recommend stops on a fixed fence to index? Let me see if I understand that. Not having a movable table saw. What do we mean? Say that again? Not having a movable table on my mortar saw, sorry. Would oh. you recommend stops on a fixed fence to index? Mm -hmm. Um, no, what I did, I, for years I had a, a mortiser that was a bench top, no, no sliding table or anything like that, and I made the lines on the top, same way, and you just push it along with your thumb. My thumb, you use thumb pressure to hold the piece against the fence and just come down, and I would just slide it one way or the other until it was right there, so that's... You don't really need to set up stops. You could, I mean, it's, but it's just more, more work. You still, yeah, I think you'll find that you can just do it with your thumb. Good old thumb pressure. Did the trick for me for years. All right, so now I'm going to just clean up this. This is long grain, so we'll get more true shavings here. And this is really set fine, so I'm getting a beautiful polish right there. 
And I don't want to take much off because I fit it pretty close on the saw. That's it. So you'd go around the whole thing. You end up with, that's just a polished surface there. This is all hand plane. These are still a little cloudy and I can see the serratedness. But other than that, you'll end up with a beautiful panel, just pristine like this. So this one, it's not quite as pretty as that other one, but the grain actually matches the door frame more. So this is all ready to go. I've got it all planed and I am, it's set to fit right into our door. So let's knock this apart. And what the heck, let's glue it up, okay? Are you guys all right with that? I know it's kind of late, but we're having too much fun. Um, it won't take long. I don't have to brush the glue in there that we great. We do have some questions, so. Okay, yeah, this is a good time yeah, for questions. Yeah, Boris says, how do you guarantee flush fit after hand planing? Do you run it through the drum sander after glue up? Um, no, a lot of times I would come back and fit it. And if you want to really get it close, you just do a quick fit, dry fit, and if you're offset, you could just skim off that one. You know what I end up doing is I get so close that, like I'm doing with this one, I'm sorry, I can't stop, but I, um, you can have a plane set like I have that. It's so light. You can come in at a kind of an angle and clean it up at the end after it's glued up without hurting anything. Or if you're really close and it's not a plane, I just lightly card scrape. And then it's okay to use a, a, a palm sander if you need to sand it a little bit. But um, I've done that and had no, no need to actually sand. But you can lightly card scrape to get any slight variations off. It's kind of like you, once you do it, you'll, you'll realize how you can sneak up on it. Do a quick test fit with just that joint. You know, like I would fit, just dry fit that one and feel if it's flush. If not, just take whatever piece needs to be hit and you can just quickly skim it. You can also just use a bench stop so you don't need to keep putting it into the dogs. That's what I'll do a lot of times. And just push against your bench stop and it's faster. I was showing you the full treatment there. So look, I'm not even going to um, brush this out. This is this will get smeared as it goes in. Um, one thing I do want to mention is I don't want to get glue up into the the end because we're going to have our frame, our panel fitted in there. Um, yes, I do have a little camber on that one because I use that, it's not the block plane, the number 62, the low angle jack. Um, but yeah, I do. I don't ever put a camber on my block plane or my number seven, cause the, or my miter plane, because those are meant for shooting angles and um, keeping things flat. But that plane, you really do want to, helps to have the little camber on there. I find, but you might want to use yours differently, you know, no big deal. All right, so I'm going to set that so it's flush on the bottom. That looks great on the inside there. And I can actually put my panel in. I'm making sure all of my arrows faces are on the same side here. Go right in this one. That looks good. Now I can plug this guy in. Faces over here. That right in the groove there. Oh, what a fit. Let me just wiggle that and I want to get it flush on the top. That feels good. Then we'll come down into the other one here. Michael's asking if you ever use spacers for base panels to control the expansion and shrinkage. Yeah, if I was, you know, when you're doing a lot of cabinets, like kitchen cabinets. You can put these little uh, space ball things that compress. Um, here, what I ended up doing a lot of times with my cabinets is I would mark the center and I'd knock a little pin through there 
And um, so you could pin it in the middle. Um, some of the old ones I saw would have that. And it, so it keeps the expansion contraction even from both sides and it's not moving in the middle at all. But here, there's a fairly stable panel. It's not, it's already in there nice. I'm gonna just let it go like that. Hey, look at that, huh? Looking pretty good. Let me get the, um, get some of this heavy glue off. We'll throw a couple quick clamps on it. And you gotta get your, you gotta get your rag from the Epic bucket. <laughs> Makes all the difference. And the rag should be clean like this. And then we're gonna just do a quick preliminary wipe. What, it's a gray rag. All right, it didn't start gray. All right, so now I can, um, let's see, we'll put a couple, let me think, how am I gonna do this? I want, Okay. Um, with all the community, do you allow room in your shallow group? Did you answer that? Um, yeah, like uh, you got to size your panel accordingly to the season and where maybe the piece is going. Um, you know, if you go into a real humid area, you got to leave a little more room for expansion. You know, if it's leaving a dry state. You want to leave more, more room there. I don't know if I can do that. Let me see if I can. Yeah, so I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm going to clamp this nice and firm. Like center these clamps. You don't need a lot of pressure. That's why I'm just using these guys here. It's working nicely. And, you know, you could put this over a rail and but they're pretty, I can sight it. I can see it's pretty true. So it looks really nice. Now I would, normally you would, I like to peg these types of doors. So I just, usually I'm gonna find the center point here. On the wider rail, sometimes you'll see two pegs, like one in this location and then one down. They're always kind of offset at angles like that. But I'm just going to put one because it's only a two and a half inch rail. So I'll eyeball the middle here on both sides. Just eyeball about the middle of that rail. Let me get this here. You could measure this, of course, um, if you don't like this generalization. But I'll bet you we're pretty close to the middle. And then. Um, we're gonna come off, I like to have the pegs about three-eighths of an inch from the shoulder here, so over three-eighths. Be sure you put the pegs into the style, not the rail. It's possible to get confused. Tom, Mike's asking, no dot of glue in the center of the panel on the end drainage? You could do that, yeah, that wouldn't be a bad idea. I didn't do it though. Sorry, good idea. <laughs> Yeah, sometimes, like I said, I have pinned it, but yeah, we could have put a dot right in there, but you have to make sure you don't smear that all along. But that's that's a good um, good suggestion. Or center the panel and pin, Ed says. Yeah, that's what I normally would do. Yeah. Kevin's asking, did you say the blade angle was eight degrees for the bevel? Yes, I did, and it's general, Kevin. You want to just um, you know do work on your test panel. You want to have a little test material of that thickness. You don't need the whole panel, but you can just do a little edge sort of and um, and get it get it so that it's fitting in the groove nicely. Let's go ahead and get this sign. Do you have any thoughts for Brett about um, on manufactured cabinets 
the panel rattling when the door closes, what would be a good way to fix that outside of soft close hinges? The panel rattling. Um, I would probably just go in the back with a little um, piece of veneer or something and slip it into the gap so you're pushing the panel forward wherever it's rattling and uh, you could put a little bit of glue on the veneer and then you kind of press it into the groove wherever it's rattling until you feel it jam in there and then you could take a knife and cut it off flush just lightly so you're just cutting through the veneer and then that'll be act as a kind of like a shim um, or a wedge we're talking like a miniature thing because you don't have much gap in there so I would think a piece of veneer would be pretty good for that uh, but that's how I would probably approach that at first maybe that won't work I don't know Uh, yeah, yeah, there are raised panels over there. Um, yeah, they're around. I mean, it's to get a panel into a groove. Um, pretty common way of getting a thicker piece of wood. A traditional way of putting that in, of putting a, a, a panel into a groove. Um, but once I've got my all my joints marked like that, I would just take, I get some kind of backer like this. And let's throw a piece over here. Is that on there? No. There we go. And I'm going to drill with a quarter inch bit here. I'm going to get the drill bit going fast and then, then gently enter the wood so I'll get a nice clean entry hole. If you go too slow, the T, that, those spurs will actually dig and chip you won't get a clean cut so let's get it into the all get it going fast and just slowly go there you go and go until you go into your bench and then you know you're there i'm just kidding i i'm, I'm a little nervous that i'm going to do that that's why i mentioned that I've got those backer pieces there so I don't um, blow it out on the back side. Um, let's go down the other end. And get it going again. Here we go. Oh, wait. I moved that clamp. I'm up in the air. I won't, the backer won't do much when you're up in the air like that. <laughs> One more. All right, I've got some, uh, I got some mahogany pegs here that I made a while back. They're kind of asymmetrical because I just whittled them kind of on my own so let's throw these pegs in here see what it looks like before i do i want to just lightly sand that rough stuff you're going to get some oops let's see blocks too wide um, i had a question before and i'm going to rephrase it because i rephrased it again uh, you said if I understand, um, I'm making bifold closet doors, mm -hmm. 80 inches tall, with three panels. Would you haunch the intermediate rails? And then he followed up and said, 80 inches tall. Um, would you have the deeper mortise and tenon at the intermediate rails, or only the one for the group? Um. You could get away probably, I mean, even this door could be, you could get away with the whole door being glued up on a quarter or three eighths inch deep groove, right? I mean, that's how a lot of kitchen cabinet companies are done. You get a pretty strong joint, but it's not quite as reliable. Um, but yeah, the middle joint isn't going to take as much stress. So if you wanted to not go the full depth, but... You know, if I was doing it, I would think you can, 
you want that all the shoulders to be uniform across your rail so why not just cut them all the same length and just mortise that center one or you can just cut the tenon shorter on the center one but yeah you can I'm sure you can get away with that there it's the top and bottom that are the most structural and keeping the whole thing together but once you've got once I've got a little drop of glue in there I rounded the end here and these are darker pegs I know but they kind of give a nice accent of contrast let's hit this one in I'm not concerned with how they're oh shoot oh wow I never went I didn't go all the way through with that one so I'm not pulling out that peg that one's just not going all the way through and uh, they don't have to go all the way through that I know that's deep enough to be through the tenon that one's all the way through and did I just I got one more yeah here we go okay so I could trim those flush now that the pegs are in we can take our clamps off and I can take um, what is that okay you can take a piece of sandpaper I like cutting them a little proud so I put a little piece of 150 grit with the grit side down and then you can come in here with a Japanese saw like this nice and easy ends up being a little up but let's do this one Go right on up and last one here Okay, once you've got those, then you can sand. I usually just take like 220 and just come in and sand those, that end grain. And you can feel the peg kind of dome a little bit. And it makes it feel like an older door because it's as if the peg has popped. That's what happens over time. They kind of rise up out of the surface from the, from the expansion and contraction. And they will pop like that. And you get this nice little domed rounded effect if you do it ahead of time. And that's it. Of course on the back, not a big deal. You can trim those flush if you like. I've got the one <laughs> missing. I could put a dummy in there if I really didn't want to have that embarrassment my whole life this one I just go flush on the back there you go beautiful there you have it a raised panel fully haunched mortise and tenon door classic traditional look it's fairly light, stable, and made to last generations. Isn't that satisfying? It's a lot of fun, hand planing. Beautiful. Basically, that's exactly the way I built this door. And it's the same situation. I've got my pegs. I didn't go all the way through with those pegs. I only went partially. So, same door. But now we can take a quick look at it. In the opening we talked about at the beginning, if this were a flat cabinet, it would go into this cabinet opening something like this. Pretty nice, huh? So flat, not going to have the dr dramatic appearance of a bow front, but definitely has a traditional look. Pretty nice look, I think.
<laughs> and uh, I'm going to have to build a cabinet now for this door. <laughs> it's, the cab it's the door without a, a home. So are there any other questions? I don't see any. There's a big hoopla about your shirt, Tom. About my shirt? I just think you're looking pretty stellar. Well, thank you. We may have some news coming soon. I've already told them they're coming soon. Oh, oh good. Okay. Yeah. I mean, wouldn't you want... <laughs> There's something about when you have that shirt on. You just... <laughs> Look, we, we don't make much money on the shirt. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> we, we barely make anything so that we can offer them to you at a good price. So you'll we see. Like that. We prefer that. You will see. Yeah. We know you're walking around with the epic woodworking on your shirt. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much for being part of this. I had a lot of fun tonight. In fact, so much fun. We almost went two hours and it went by like that. So I hope if, obviously, if you had to check out, you're not here now. <laughs> but <laughs> I hope you've seen this later and found it was worthwhile to hang in there and take this door all the way through to the end. But thank you for being here. We really appreciate you. We, we couldn't do this, obviously, without someone on the other side of the camera. But more than that, we've really enjoyed the relationships that have grown to see the community flourishing yes. and the goodwill and the love and the, all the creativity that's coming out of this, this gathering. And we're just excited for the future and the new projects we have. So on behalf of the camera lady and myself, thanks for being here. We'll look forward to seeing you next time on Shop Night Live. Ah. See you next week. See you later, everybody. Thank you. Good night.